Good morning, CBC. Doing all right today? 50% of us are extremely happy today because of the game, and 50% of us are miserable. That's me. Can't believe it. Cannot believe it. The, the devil. I like the, I like the 11 o'clock service. You guys are lively, hungry for Jesus. I like it. Keep it going. <laughs> um, so Aaron is still on vacation. Uh, he's, in, he's actually in my hometown. He's in Hawaii right now. That's where I grew up. Grew up in Hawaii, and he's sending me videos of him jumping off Waimea Bay's cliff. And I'm like, wait a minute, that should be me. <laughs> but a few months ago, he asked me to uh, speak this morning. And I said, oh, so you're going to go to Hawaii. What, okay, what's the scripture you want me to speak on? He goes, eh, it's just about casting out demons in the synagogue or something. You'll be fine. I was like, thanks, Aaron. <laughs> thanks. I'll switch places with you right about now. Um, but no, I'm excited, and, and I'm hoping that he's having a great time in Hawaii, just relaxing. And I, honestly, I just feel like the Lord wants me to just affirm, before I get into the message, affirm the pastors and the elders of this church and the staff of this church, Aaron is a guy that he deserves his relaxation, man. He's, he's been working hard, and he's a guy that lives with integrity. He has, me, he has treated our family with uh, nothing but, uh, even when we're going through nothing but the best, even when we're going through hard times and arguing with, with each other, man, it's, it's a family. And, and so much, we're so lucky to have so much of the other staff here, like Jordan, Jordan and Jenny, like they're like a couple, the worship pastor and his wife, they never sin. Like they're like the kind of couple, they're in my small group, and it's like they never sinned before in their life. They're so nice. <laughs> and you got like, you got like Preston, obviously he sinned a bunch in his, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. I, he was here in the first service, and I said that, and he laughed. Um, but like Preston, man, he's all about the gospel. And if you're not aligning yourself with the gospel, he, he's going to make sure that we are. If there's something that's wrong, he's going to make sure the gospel is first and foremost. And I want that with my kids growing up in the ministry here, uh, in, in CBC's youth ministry. I want that. I want, my, I want my youth pastor to challenge my son and to challenge my, my kids on what it means to follow Jesus in the gospel. Um, Emily Ann and... and um, Haley and all Emily Ann, there's no other person that can love your kids more than Emily Ann does. Um, missions director, she's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> good looking, but kind of weird. <laughs> Just if you don't know, that's my wife. So I can say whatever I want. I don't get paid from this church. Just joking. Um, where was I going with all this? I just want to affirm that the elders. They've done nothing but blessed me and my family through all the, we've gone through, this church has gone through so much hardship and so much blessing in these last 10 years that we've been a part of this church, but they've consistently met us with grace and open arms through all my failure, through all everything that I have uh, portrayed. Man, I'm just, we're just blessed to be a part of this church. And I just wanted to do that and affirm them, give some thanks publicly to them, because, you know, I, in the Old Testament, it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, right? It doesn't say that, what, and what does that mean? We're trying to enter the presence of God in the tabernacle. You, you're not going to enter the presence of God through cynicism or criticalness or anything like that. We're going to enter the presence of God with thanksgiving and praise. And uh, I believe that God wants to do a work among this church, and uh, I, I believe that he has a message for us this morning. Amen? I'm going to pray and get started. Jesus, thank you for this day. I pray that if there's anything that I'm trying to say right now that I have written down and you don't want me to say it, have me not. And if there's anything that you don't want me to, you want me to say and that I'm not, I pray that you will. I pray that it will not be just a, a, a sermon that is a sermon and people will be like, oh, cool. But I pray, Lord, you will transform my life. You will transform everybody's lives in here by the power of your Holy Spirit and the power of the written word, God, that we're just going to read and it's going gonna, it's gonna to shape us, God. I just believe that this morning. This is going to shape us. Give us visions, God, this morning of what uh, steps we need to take, God. But just be with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so if you want to open your Bibles, Luke uh, 4, verse 31. We're going to be going through the end of uh, chapter 4, so the beginning of chapter 5. Basically, we're going to read through a day in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, okay? A day in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. What was it like? Um, and just to give you a preview of what we're going to do, we're going to go verse by verse through this for like the first five, ten minutes. Um, and then I'm just going to draw out three, three points that I feel like the Lord wants to share with us today. 
Um, and then we'll be good. So starting in verse 31. Um, then he went down to Capernaum. So Jesus was just in Nazareth. He spoke in the synagogue. As Charles spoke last week, he spoke in the synagogue. And they, were, they, they loved him at first. And then he started talking about his authority and who he was. And they wanted to drive him off a cliff. But he somehow snuck out of Nazareth. And he went to this place just a little bit up the road called Capernaum. Uh, Capernaum was a town in Galilee, and he was teaching them on a, the Sabbath. They were astonished at his teaching because his message had authority. Everybody say authority. authority. That's one of the main themes today, y'all, authority. What does it mean, stop there, what does it mean that Jesus was teaching with authority? So it wouldn't be uncommon for a traveling rabbi would be visiting a, a, synagogue, a, a synagogue and, and would open up the scriptures, and then he would expound the scriptures. This is not uncommon. So this is what Jesus is doing. He's a traveling minister. He's a traveling rabbi, and news about him is starting to spread because of what he's doing in other towns. It's like, hey, Jesus, can you come and, and do the, uh, the reading today? So Jesus, and Jesus reads, and he teaches with authority. But the difference between Jesus is most rabbis would read the text and quote other commentators, right? Quote other rabbis. This, hey, this is rabbi... Uh, this is this rabbi's interpretation of this scripture. Oh, this is this rabbi's interpretation of this scripture. But when Jesus was speaking with authority, it was almost as if he was speaking, uh, he was, as if he was speaking like he knew the main point of the scripture, almost like he wrote the scriptures himself. They were astonished at his teaching in authority. And as he's teaching with authority, verse 33, in the synagogue there was a man with an unclean demonic spirit who cried out with a loud voice, leave us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, Jesus doesn't seem to care, but if I had somebody in this service right now just jump up and start manifesting a demon, I'd have to uh, <laughs> call, Pastor, call Pastor Elder Charles up here. No, I'm just <laughs> But, so this guy has Jesus teaching with authority, comes out and he, and he speaks to Jesus, have you, have you come here to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, demon, demonic spirits and demon possession was not uncommon in the, like, nowadays we're like, how many of you guys have had, a, ha, had an experience with a demonic spirit? Some? Okay. But in this age, this was prevalent, right? Prevalent. Demon possession was prevalent. And there was even exorcists in this time that almost, as you read about it, they almost had like Harry Potter-like wizardry approaches to casting out demons. And reading about these is kind of, kind of weird. Like one of them, you would dunk the head of this guy in a, in, a, in, a, in a bucket almost to drown the demon out. There was another practice in this time where they would grab feces. I know, yeah, feces, stick it by their nose until and almost to sink the demon out of the person. There was another even more crazier uh, practice that they would have, which apparently this can happen. They would get a drill and they would drill into their skull. I guess you can do that and not die. Didn't think that could be, it would be possible, but there's a certain way you can do that apparently and, and almost to leave an escape route for the demons. And I was like, that is crazy. But we're going to try that one uh, here today. Anybody... I'm going to volunteer, you want to volunteer, no. But the interesting about that and seeing Jesus' authority here was what does Jesus do, right? The demon speaks out to Jesus, what does he do? Does he do some kind of crazy karate ninja Harry Potter stuff? No, he looks at the demon and says, be quiet, come out of him, right? That was it. And so what the scriptures are showing us is, and to, to the people sitting in the synagogue right there, they'd be like, man, he didn't have to do anything, he didn't have to get poop, he didn't have to get a drill, Right? He just said, be quiet, come out of him. And throwing him down before him, the demon came out of him without hurting him at all. Amazement came over them all, and they were saying to one another, what is this message? Man, what is this gospel? What is this message where he commands the unclean spirits with authority, say authority, and power, say power, power. authority and power, and they came out. And news about him began to go out to every place in the city. Jesus Christ of Nazareth started to trend on Jerusalem's Twitter, right? This guy is healing people. He's teaching with authority. Unclean spirits are coming out, all right? So then the synagogue, the service is over. You think, man, that's a pretty good day. Jesus went and taught with authority. People got moved. And then a demon got cast out. If that was me today, I'd be like, man, I did a pretty good work for the kingdom of God today, right? 
But Jesus wasn't done. He's going to go to lunch at Simon's house. And, you know, it's lunch, Sunday lunch at mother-in-law's, right? That's always a fun time. So he goes over to Sunday lunch, and, and, and he sees that Simon's mother-in-law has a fever. Now, it's not just a fever like we get, but back in those days, this fever probably could have been deadly. So what, what happens? Verse 38, after he left the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up immediately and began to serve him. So not only is Jesus teaching with authority, he is not only has authority over the demonic spirits, but now he has authority over sickness and disease, and he heals this woman. That's a pretty good day, all right? But he's not done yet. <laughs> When the sun was setting, all those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him. As he laid his hands on each one of them, he healed them. Also, demons were coming out of many, shouting and saying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. So he goes through all that, he heals, and all of a sudden, people start hearing about Jesus of Nazareth. He's healing. So all the sick and the demon-possessed people, they come to Jesus to get healed, right? And that's how it should be, right? Where the gospel is, there should be healing and salvation. And so they come to Jesus, and they get radically healed. Verse 42, when it was day, he went out and made his way to a deserted place. But the crowds were searching for him. They came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, it is necessary for me to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. And he was then preaching in the synagogue of Judea. So all these crowds gathered, then he goes to sleep that day. He goes into a solitary place to pray. And that's a message for another day, right? <laughs> if you're going, doing ministry, casting out demons, all these kind of things, being an effective disciple, you need to have that place that solitary place with your father to get perspective on life. But that's a sermon for another day. So in, these, in this text, I believe God wants us to remind us of three things this morning. First thing is the reality of the demonic in our everyday life. Or as my friend, uh, my squad mate uh, Royal says, we were talking about, man, all of us, all of us in our families on my squad at work, we were going through stuff, and he goes, mm-hmm, David, devil's busy. Devil's busy, David. I was like, I like that. The devil is busy. The devil is busy. And that's what first, in 1 Peter 5, 8, that's what Peter describes the devil as. He says, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking to whom he may devour. Ephesians 6 says, talks about putting on your armor, right? Talk about putting on your armor. If you didn't, if you had to... Why would you need to put on armor if you weren't going to a battle every day? If there was an actively uh, assault on your life from the enemy trying to persuade you from the purposes of the gospel, why would you need armor? That's why in Ephesians uh, 6 it says, Finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take the, your stand against the devil's schemes. The devil has schemes against every one of us individually, we need to recognize, and corporately as a church. Okay? Then he says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against one another, right? The enemy would want us to do that, right? That's one of his schemes is to be to fight with one another. But our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. So the Bible states that there is spiritual forces, uh, rulers, authorities, in this dark world, in the heavenly realms, that are actively competing for our attention from to God. And if you see the news and you see, you re watch the news, read the newspaper, whatever it is, we don't have newspapers anymore, I don't know what I'm saying, but if you read that, you know the devil is busy. He is seeking to whom he may devour. I made a joke in the first service, some of you college students, if you've ever met my dog Debo, if you don't believe in demons, you never met my dog Debo. She's got about 12 demons possessed in her at all times. If anybody feels free to have a dog, she's free. Just joking, kids. Just joking. Kind of. 
So he, we need to be, he wants to remind us of the reality of the demonic, that we are at a war every single day and be alert to put our armor on and to know we are at a war against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. But I don't want to focus on that this morning for too long. I want to focus mainly on the authority of Jesus. And number three, our effectiveness in the kingdom hinges on our revelation of the authority of Jesus. We see in this story and throughout the gospels that Jesus has authority over what? We saw what? He's authority of the word of God. He has authority over demons, right? Because he's casting them out left and right. You read through the gospels, it's like bam, bam, bam. We see he has authority over sickness, right? He healed the, he healed the lady. And throughout the Gospels, he heals all kinds of sick. He heals the people with leprosy. He's healing people with uh, blindness. He's even raising people from the dead. He has authority over sickness. We read through the Gospels, even in Luke 8, right? 8.22, he has authority over nature. Do you remember that story when the disciples are on the boat and Jesus is sleeping? He's just having a little nap on the boat, right? And their big windstorm comes and the disciples think they're going to die. They're like, hey, Messiah, wake up. What are you going to do? We're about to die. And Jesus is like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you of little faith. And he rebukes the storm and he has power over nature, right? So he has power over nature. We see he, Jesus has a uh, Authority over food, right? What does he do? Loaves and fishes. He multiplies them, right? He multiplies the food. He even has uh, authority over like fishing, right? You remember when the disciples are on the boat and they've been fishing all day, they haven't caught anything. And Jesus, I can just imagine Jesus going, watch this. He's like, hey, put your net on the other side, see what you get. And all of a sudden they throw their net on the other side and they get all this fish. You're like, who is this guy, right? Who is this Jesus? He has authority over demons, death, sickness, nature, food. He has authority over our salvation, right? There is no other name that you can enter heaven besides Jesus Christ. You can't Google, hey, I'm going to Google 300 Heaven Boulevard and, and try to make it to heaven. You can't get there. You can't hire Elon Musk or, or Jeff Bezos. All the money in the world can't buy you a ticket to heaven only through his death and resurrection on the cross. The authority of salvation comes only through Jesus Christ. And Jesus then sums up his authority in Matthew 28, 18, right? He says, he says to disciples, one of the last things he says before he ascends into heaven, he says, all authority on where? In just in heaven, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me, right? And so why is he saying this right now? Why, why do you think Jesus is saying this to disciples at this time? Because he knows that he is about to go be with the Father. And the disciples are going to be the ones expanding the kingdom of God. The church is going to be the ones advancing the kingdom of God against the devil. And guess what happens when we advance against the kingdom of darkness? The devil fights back. But Jesus wants to remind his disciples that before he goes, that they need to know that Jesus has all authority. No matter what kind of demonic forces come against the church or come against you individually, that Jesus has all authority on heaven and on earth. That's why he didn't just say, all authority on heaven and earth be given to me because, hey, look at me, look how cool I am, right? He says what? All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me, then what? Therefore, go, right? He prefaces going into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you to the end, very end of the age. He prefaces the going with the knowing, right? We need to know the authority of Jesus. It's crucial, it, and it's crucial, our effectiveness to the kingdom of, to the kingdom of God is crucial on understanding the Jesus' authority over all things. All authority has been given to me, therefore I'm sending you out with that authority to go into all the world and make disciples. But we have to know before we go, right? Know the authority of Jesus because the devil's going to fight back. But the encouraging thing is Jesus has all authority. Um, about six years ago, six, seven years ago, I'm, I'm a police officer by trade, and I don't know if that's a trade. I don't know about my job. About six years ago, <coughs> excuse me, we went through, we go through this thing called the police academy. And the police academy, you go, it's six months and you're learning about 
law, right? You're learning about constitutional law. You're learning about city ordinances. You're learning about case law <coughs> and Supreme Court uh, decisions and all these kind of things. So you're getting all this knowledge when you're in the academy, right? You're in classes. You've got to pass tests and tactical things and different things like that, right? And the academy is not really that hard. The hard part comes after the academy, right? You sit there and you know everything. You pass all the tests. And then one day you graduate and, and somebody pins a badge on you and they say, and they say, David Lehman, I am now giving you authority to uphold this law that you have learned about, right? I've given you authority. So we've now learned the law, but then it's one thing to learn it, but then we got to actually practice it. And then you go through about 12 weeks of field training with a field training officer. And I used to be one of those, train new officers as they came in. And the funny thing is, you think you know it all when you go graduate from the academy, right? I know all the laws. I know it backwards and forwards. I'm good. And then you hit the street. And that first call you go on, you're like, what? Somebody comes up to you and it's like, hey, hey, officer, that guy just stole my car. He just stole your car? Hold on, let me look at my book real quick. Uh, North Carolina General Statute 14 dash blah blah. Oh, that's a crime. <laughs> yeah, officer, he just stole my car. Oh, okay, I have authority to go. I gotta go get him now. Okay, and that's almost the reaction time when you first start, right? Because it's like you know things, but you're just starting to exercise your authority over how you uphold the law. And I always tell young young guys, I'm like, man, it takes you about three years of going hard, hard, hard to, to, uh, to, to really feel comfortable in exercising your authority over every call that you get, to know what you do. Now, six, seven, eight years in, whatever I'm at, uh, I, I know, I can say, boom, I see something, I know my authority in it because I've exercised and practiced it. A lot of times in the Western church especially, I feel like we, a lot of us, we do the academy part real well, right? <laughs> We do the academy part real well. We got Bible studies. We got sermon studies. We got small groups, D groups, uh, every kind of thing to gain our knowledge of the authority and power and the theology, which is all great. I'm in a small group. I'm about to lead a D group. That's all great and crucial to our Christian growth. But for some reason, we get stuck in the academy portion of our Christian faith. We never move out to exercising authority over the dark in this world. And uh, when you look at how Jesus trained his disciples, right, it wasn't, he didn't take them to the nice safe places, did he? He didn't, he didn't give them a nice comfortable, uh, you know, cushiony seat with a big screen, and nice air conditioning, make sure you come, right? What did Jesus do? He took them to the hardest places. One example of this is Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus is in uh, the region of Caesarea Philippi, right, and it's one of the most crucial questions, I believe, that he asked his disciples. And it's one of the most crucial questions we need to ask ourselves this morning. Matthew 16, 13, he says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that, I, that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others of Jeremiah said, All of Jeremiah are one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, but what about you, Peter? Who do you, who do you say that I am, right? And that's one of the most crucial questions, right? He's asking Peter, he's like, hey, Peter, it, it doesn't matter who they say I am, right? Ma it doesn't matter who Pastor Aaron says Jesus is. It doesn't matter who David says Jesus is. It doesn't matter who anybody in the church, your favorite podcaster or pastor, who's, who they say Jesus is. It's when you're laying in your bed at your darkest moment, who do you say Jesus is? When you feel like the enemy is surrounding you and there's nothing left to fight, who do you say Jesus is? And does he truly have all authority on heaven and on earth? Another uh, another scripture I'm just going to read real quick, Ephesians 4. See, Paul want, wanted to reiterate this. Uh, sorry, not Ephesians 4, Ephesians 1. Paul wanted to reiterate this to the church in Ephesus. He says, 118, he says, this is his prayer for them. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance for his saints? 
And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the mighty working of his strength. So he's praying, Paul is praying that our eyes will be enlightened so that we may know the hope of our calling. What is the hope of our calling? Well, it is the wealth of his glorious inheritance for the saints. And what, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? Jesus is, Paul is praying that we will understand the immeasurable greatness of his power that is bestowed upon us through the Holy Spirit. He wants us to know the authority of Jesus and the power that he has bestowed upon us. Then he even describes this power in verse 20. He says, he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler, authority, and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but the age to come. So he tells us about the immeasurable greatness power, then he describes it. So what this power is, David, what this power is, CBC, that God has bestowed upon his people is the same power that raised Christ from the dead, right? That's that same power is what we, is our, our inheritance as followers of Jesus. And so if I go back to the story of Caesarea Philippi, if I get a little more context in it, I can, of what Caesarea Philippi is at the time, I get a little more even picture of what's going on. Caesarea Philippi was one of the darkest places that you can imagine. Right? It was at the foot of Mount Hermon, and there was this temple that was, that was built into the mountain and these uh, like grotto watery caves, right? And they all, the Greeks and the pagans, they worshiped this god named Pan. And, they, and there was the most right, hedonistic, uh, sadistic, sexual immoral sacrifices were going on in, in this temple. They had a little grotto of, of water that... Uh, entered into these gates and they would throw their sacrifices, sometimes human sacrifice, sometimes animal sacrifices, to see if it was, uh, if it would be uh, received by the god Pan. And the way they would, the way they would judge that is if the, the person or the animal came in, if there was blood that came out, that means it was not acceptable. If there's no blood that came out, it means it was acceptable. So you all, you think the craziest thing that you think, oh man, America's going crazy, Right? Caesarea Philippi was like times 100. So I can just imagine Peter, right? Being like, hey, Jesus, <laughs> I see this temple right here. Hey, Jesus, uh, I know I've seen you cast out some demons. I know I've seen you heal the sick and, and do all this kind of stuff, but this is on another level, right? I, I just don't know, God, if, if, if your power can be manifested in this place, if the kingdom of God can advance on this place. And this is just me imagining, but I, I wonder if this is what Jesus is actually doing here. He's looking at Peter, and he's saying, Peter, despite of all that, who do you say that I am? Because even for me sometimes, right, it's like I can trust God in certain situations, right? God, I, can, I can point to areas and times in my life where God has come through and set me free, and God has moved in me, um, to see the gospel proclaimed, to see people come, come to know Jesus. I, I can, but then I can also know in my life there are some situations that, God, this is just too much. I don't know if you can get me through this right now. And God wants to remind us this morning, he's like, no, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. He had a revelation of the authority of Jesus. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. So I wonder if he's, Jesus is looking at this rock and he's saying, Peter, on this rock, on the worst of the worst, the worst that you've ever seen, in all your fear, in all your insecurities, you have to trust that I have all authority and I have sent you. Therefore, go build my kingdom. And that's what he's saying to CBC this morning. All right. God has called the church not to run away from the gates of hell or evil in this world, right? We're not here to get away from the dirt in our society and hopefully not be contaminated by it and, and sneak our way into heaven one day. 
Our job is to, through the power of Jesus, attack the very gates of hell, not in our own power and authority, but the authority we are sent by the king of the universe. Amen? A man or woman who understands the authority of Jesus is an untouchable being, human being, by earthly authorities. Earthly authorities can't touch him, right? I'll give you an example. Paul, for example, right? The authority said, Paul, you better hush up about Jesus. You better stop preaching about Jesus or we're going to kill you. Paul says, Philippians 1.21, if you kill me to die is gain. That's great. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to let you live then. All right. Philippians 1.21, verse A, to live is Christ. <laughs> Right? If I live, it means fruitful labor for me. Ah, uh, okay, okay, Paul. It's okay. Well, I'm not gonna. We're not gonna kill you or let you leave. We're gonna. Instead of that, we're gonna torture you. All right, we're gonna torture you, Paul. And Paul's response is, "Well, I'm not gonna like that." But Second Corinthians four seventeen. I, I'm saying, for this light momentary affliction is preparing me for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Like I'm not gonna like being tortured, but guess what? This affliction, this momentary affliction, is preparing me for an eternal weight of glory. So go do what you gotta do. Okay, okay, hey, we're not gonna torture you then. I I know how to get you, Paul. I know how to get you. We're gonna throw you in jail, and I'm gonna throw away the key. How are you going to preach Jesus then? Well, that's a good point. But just to let you know, an angel will probably let me escape and open up the gates for me at one point. But in the meantime, if he doesn't, I am going to convert the jail guards, and then the jail guards are going to go out and preach the gospel to the cities and, and do everything that I wish that I could be doing out there. But you're making me stuck in here, right? And, oh, and by the way, in the meantime, I'm going to praise God in these chains, and then somebody's going to give me some pen and paper papyrus to write on, and I'm going to write letters that is going to reverberate throughout history through the church of Ephesus. <laughs> Paul was untouchable. Why? Not because he was so great. Not because he was so amazing. But because Paul had a, Paul had a revelation of the authority of Jesus Christ in his life. He had a revelation of the power that is bestowed upon us by the Holy Spirit. That he knew no earthly authority could touch him as long as he was in the care of Jesus Christ. This is why, and I'm just, I don't have this on my paper. This is why, there, and I don't even remember, there's a part in Acts that the sons of, seven sons of Zebedee are casting out demons. They say, in Jesus' name, in, uh, in Jesus' name, who Paul preaches, I cast you out. The demons end up beating up these seven sons of Sceva. But what's interesting th to me about this, that little random story, is who did they know? They knew Jesus, and they knew Paul, the very people that were walking out and exercising the authority of Jesus. Because Paul was known by the devil because he was causing havoc to the kingdom of God. Um, I'm going to finish with one last story. Have y'all ever been to the zoo? I know I just went heavy on y'all and I started talking about the zoo. <laughs> Who has, raise your hand if you've been to the zoo. All right. And as a, as a dad, I love, you know, the first time you want to take your kids to the zoo, right? You're excited because, they, you know, they hear, they watch like, uh, what kind of car, you know, whatever, Lion King and all that kind of stuff. And they're like, man, David, I can't wait to show. What do you want to see, Eli? What do you want to see, Caleb? Well, I want to see the king of the jungle. I want to see the, what? The lion. Right, the lion is the king of the jungle, and they see these cartoons, and they see National Geographic, and oh, the lion's roaring and going hunting after people. The king of the jungle. And you go into the zoo, right? North Carolina Zoo, I mean, you, you, drive, you walk like five miles before you get there. But you get, you know, the parents know what I mean, right? When you go to Africa, North America, you only have time for one of them, because your legs are dead. I'm, I don't know what I'm doing right now. Um, <laughs> what am I talking about? Lion. The lion. So you, this powerful lion, this king of the jungle, right? But what happens when you get to the lion pen? What do you see? He's sleeping. This big king of the jungle that you are, your kids are like, I want to see this lion. Where's the lion? And he's like, this lion is like laid out on a rock in the sun. And he's like, the, the caretakers are throwing pounds of meat at his mouth. And he can't even like get up and he's just, argh, he's grabbing the meat. You know what I mean? And he's just, I'm just like, what kind of big old pathetic cat is this? And uh, 
<laughs> it reminded me of an illustration that Francis Chan, a pastor, once said, and I think I'm going to finish with it today. You guys ever seen that movie, Madagascar? All right, Madagascar is a cartoon movie about these animals in a zoo, right? And there's one scene, it's the zebra's birthday, and the zebra is running on a treadmill, right? And he's running on a treadmill with this, like, movie of him running in the savannah. Because his whole dream, he's like, well, I don't want to be locked up in this zoo. I was made to live in the savannah. I was made to be free, right? And the lion is trying to convince him, hey, zebra, just chill. You don't want to go out there. It's dangerous out there. There's lions, or there's, there's animals out there that could eat you. There's other lions that'll eat you out there. We're safe in here. We get people come to watch us. We're celebrities. We get fed every day. We don't got to hunt. But the zebra's like, no, I'm made for the savannah. I'm made for the wild. So uh, the lion helps him to escape along with some funny little penguins. And uh, they escape to the savannah, right? And the next scene is the zebra running in the savannah. He's like, I'm finally where I'm supposed to be. And then there's a picture of the lion running on two feet. And the zebra's like, no, lion, you don't, you don't run on two feet. You're supposed to run on four feet. And the lion's just trying to figure out how he's running in the, in, he's running, and all of a sudden he starts running on four feet, and all of a sudden the lion lets out a roar. Rawr. Right? The first time the lion had actually found his roar because he was in the wild. And his point, Francis Chan's point in all this, is sometimes the search, the church can be like a zoo, right? Hey, stay in here where it's safe. Don't go out and exercise your authority and try because it's safe in here. As long as Pastor Aaron's feeding me, as long as Emily Ann is giving me a good uh, children's ministry, as long as the youth ministry is good, as long as Jordan is singing the perfect chords and not, mess, not messing up his all, as long as that's good, we're safe in here. But that's not where we're supposed to live. We become like that lion just being overfed off steak because we're not, you, we're not out hunting against the attack of the enemy. We're not hunting and feeding. We lose our muscle. We lose our strength. We lose, that's why when you look at the lions at the zoo, they look skinny. Then you look at a lion in the wild and they got their mane up and they're ready to attack and pounce. That's who Christians are supposed to be. That's who God wants CBC to be. He wants to make a church that is gets rid of all their business. They come and worship Jesus in here and gets taught the word with authority and all of our sin comes out at the throne of Jesus when the word of God is preached with authority. And then we say, I'm not just going to stay here. I need to learn how to exercise my authority on the streets of High Point Green Greensboro and to the nations of the earth. That's why I named this message, Tyler's message, was a dangerous authority. Because if we understand this authority, it makes us dangerous as a church. You look at the book of Acts, and I'm going to finish. You look at the book of Acts, and a casual reading of the book of Acts will show you, like, well, I don't see that in, I don't see that in my, I don't see that in my life. And as I preach this message, y'all, I'm not saying, I got this. <laughs> I am not here. I just hunger to be there. I hunger to be on the street. And when, when I see someone needing an encounter with Jesus, I am bold enough to proclaim the gospel and bold enough if they have a demonic spirit in them to cast them out in Jesus' name, not by my authority, but through the power of Jesus. And that's the vision for this church. A couple months ago, Aaron, I remember him saying, on stage after a service, and it was first service because you guys are holy and hungry. Uh, he said in first service after worship, he said, you know what? God wants to do something through CBC powerfully. He wants to move in this church. But he said, there's something holding us back. And he said, I don't even know what it is. I don't know if, if any of you remember him saying that. He said, I don't even know what it is. So if you know, you know, come and tell me. But I believe his first statement is totally true. Well, all of his statements is totally true. That God is wanting and positioning CBC to have a move of God. But the question is, it's not going to come just through pastor and everybody else. It's going to come through the body rising up. It's going to come through prayer movements that are started 
that prayer movement that dozens and dozens of people are going to gather at the church or in the community and walk around the community and pray against the spiritual forces of evil that are attacking our city and our family. It's going to come by us taking the authority out to the streets and saying, wherever I work, live, and play, I'm going to live with the authority. I'm going to wake up, put on my armor, understand my authority, understand the power of God in my life, and he has sent me to therefore go. Use this gospel for salvation, to heal the brokenhearted, to finish the Great Commission. So I'm going to finish there. I'm going to have the band come up, and we're going to sing this last song. Yeah, it's called The Power. That's the power. And in this song, and as we worship, if there's something that, there's some of you in here that might have an oppressed, some, you've, man, I've, I just feel like I've been oppressed. I feel like I'm, or I'm living in sin right now, right? You can, you can, you can be in church every Sunday. Trust me, I know. You can be in church every Sunday and be living in ultimate blatant sin. If that's you this morning, you need to get it right with Jesus. If you feel like you're being oppressed by the enemy in any way, you need to get right with Jesus this morning. If you feel like, I don't have that hunger, David, well, during this song, raise your hands to Jesus and cry out to God for hunger. Cry out to God for his spirit to fall in your life. And again, I'm not there. I'm just hungering to be there because I want to be untouchable for the kingdom of darkness. And I know when we, when we step out in faith and we do this, the enemy attacks. That's why we need to understand all the authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. And Jesus sends us out with that power. Amen. So let's all stand together this morning and worship and be reminded of the power of Jesus.
Amen. Well, this morning, thank you all for being here. I just pray that the Spirit of God moved in our lives this morning and moved in mine. I pray that you will be sent out this week. Let's go this week and, and attack the gates of hell and, and, and get some, gain some territory on the enemy this week. This is part of it right here, too. I'm going to give a shameless plug. You guys have these on your seats, and why do you have these on your seats? This is part of being light in a dark world. We want to invite people to this Easter fest on April 9th. We want to invite one person here to this church that you know doesn't go to church or doesn't know Jesus. Invite them to come. Get in a conversation with them about Jesus, about the power of the gospel. It has the church times, 9-11, the website, and everything on here. So go out into the world, and this is your first step. What do I do? Hey, first step, grab one of these, give them to somebody you know at work. Tell them to come to church and be a part of a move of God. Tell them about the gospel. Tell them about the power that is in the name of Jesus. We love you guys. You have been sent.